Okay. <laughs> Just like our last poet, unfortunately or fortunately for you guys, the context is not as extensive, meaning the context is a lot easier to kind of grasp and remember, but it might not be as interesting as some of you are used to. That is because we have an alive poet. Okay, so again, a much more modern poet, Maura Dooley, okay, born in 1957 in Cornwall. Um, she grew up in Bristol and she worked for a while and fell in love with Yorkshire later on in her life. Gives us a good hint here as to where the title might have come from, okay? She now, however, lives in London and is a professor at the University of Goldsmiths, okay? Um, thinking about the time period, I want you to think about the fact that there would be no social media available. So communication would be much more difficult between two people if they were not in one household. Whether that was phone calls, but you would have to make sure that they're in or else you would miss them or you would write letters, whatever it might be, but communication was harder. Um, Dooley did say in an interview that she wrote this poem while she was living in a tiny little flat, which might give us some insight into the fact that she's actually missing Yorkshire, the beauty of the country um, side, much more than she is missing the actual person that is residing in Yorkshire. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do title analysis before we even read the poem, which is Letters from Yorkshire who is going to give me something, connotations, about any of the words in the title. Right, Amber, let's go. Let's hear you. What do you think? Um, well, when you think of letters, usually, uh, unless they're like bills, usually people send them People usually see letters as something beautiful, something unique and personal. So if you get a letter from someone you haven't heard from for about three years, that, it kind of gives you like a, it makes you happy and it gives you like a nice feeling. And Yorkshire, if you've ever been, it's, it's a really beautiful place Good. and it's yep. very natural. So letters from Yorkshire should, could mean, um, she's feeling the beauty of Yorkshire through the beauty of the letter. Wonderfully said. Great. So we see the personal beauty there. Hold on. I'm going to, how do I mute you again? <laughs> right. I've muted you. So we see the personal beauty in the actual letters and the beauty between that relationship. And then we see the beauty in Yorkshire and as um, some of you might know, if you started your research, research yesterday, Yorkshire is known by the locals as the God's own country, right? And that is because of its stunning natural beauty. So that makes sense why she uses such natural imagery throughout her poem. May says, perhaps she doesn't care about the letters she sends from London in the sense she wants the focus to be on the letters from this man that she loves. Good. So it is, she is focusing on the letters that she receives which links to what Lucia just said, the fact that the title also has a quite nostalgic tone. There's something in remembering, there's something in missing someone on the other end. Now, by the end of today's session, I want to see if any of you have changed your mind because May said that it's about this man that she loves, but actually we could argue that the relationship or type of a relationship isn't as clear as the rest of the poems. We're not quite sure what kind of um, relationship they have, whether it's familial, what, whether it, it is romantic, um, or how we can find that out, or what kind of clue she gives us. Um, Amber says, I think she loves the place more, and it's more of a platonic love. Yeah, good. So because of the title, and because of a lot of the things that she incorporates, like the natural imagery, it's almost like the person on the other end is not as relevant as the feelings that the person on the other end evokes. 
right? So we have a lot of natural imagery that kind of brings in the beauty of the place. May said she said that it was it was open to interpretation, so her readers could feel more connected to it. Beautiful. I'm going to actually give you that quote that she said. Um, so just a few general things before I read it. As I just mentioned, it is one of the most ambiguous poems that we have in this collection, right? That is because we're not quite sure what the actual relationship is. We're also not quite sure um, if we can understand or analyze every single image that is um, portrayed in this or if it's a personal image or how we interpret it. So it's very ambiguous, okay? Especially that ending we'll get to in a second. Um, but here are some things that critics have said about Dooley's writing. So I think some of you have seen this. I can hear from your thoughts already that some of you have done some research on this. But a critic said that Dooley is able to make detailed domains, domesticity, right? So domestic things, working in the household, um, household chores, combined with lyrical beauty. Okay, so there's that detailed everyday mundane routine mixed in with the beauty of the sound she creates in the poem. Another critic says that Julie is able to find images for complex feelings. Okay, so find images for complex feelings. Now this is really interesting because of course this is probably what poetry tries to do all the time. Um, that it tries to express something that we can't quite put our head around or find a single word for. And that's why she creates these images to try to evoke some kind of feeling. And that can link to what May just said, which is there's a lot of homesickness in this poem, showing it's about the distance and the feelings, right? Very good, May. So she's able to capture that feeling of homesickness in her poem and express it through the images that she decides to use. Um, now, she herself, and as I can see, some of you already did that, but she herself describes it as a mundane mystery feeling. So mixing the mundane, should you read that again? I'm going to put it in, see ya. Um, detailed. lyrical beauty yeah and she can find images for complex feelings see that all right okay brilliant okay so we have that and the poet says it that she is able to create or attempts to create a mundane feeling a mundane mystery feeling okay and that links back to what um, may was saying at the beginning which is that she wants to, us to find our own connections with the poem which again is probably why she makes it so ambiguous okay right so what i want us to think about now when we're reading through it for the first time what are the main images here what are the big lexical fields, the ones that keep getting repeated, okay? What is it that this poem is actually about at all? What's the story here? And how do we know that that's the story? We might not know specifically who the characters of this story are, but what is happening and what can we tell? All right, here we go. In February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwings return and came indoors to write to me, his knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. It's not romance, simply how things are. You out there in the cold, seeing the seasons turning, me with my heart full of headlines feeding words onto a blank screen. Is your life more real because you dig and sow? You wouldn't say so. Breaking ice on a water butt, clearing a path through snow. Still, it's you who sends me word of the other world, 
pouring air and light into an envelope so that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. All right, now I can already see some of you definitely understanding the poem and adding in um, some of the key elements here. Amber says nature, manual labor, artificial homesickness, good. May says nature, distance, and a fractured relationship, very good. Jasmine says love, long distance relationships, that's crucial there. Okay, very good. Who is willing to give their interpretation of the narrative that is happening? So you don't have to necessarily analyze any of the language, but what is literally happening between the two people in our poem? Anyone willing to give it a go? No? You might start off with thinking about what are their jobs or what is it that they do with their day and how is it so different? Amber's talking about how it's not a close relationship just to stay connected. Yeah, so it's interesting when we start to try to interpret what kind of relationship they have. But what is it that she does? Separation. Good, Lucia, we're already getting to analysis. Save that for a second. Lucia, I'm gonna put you on the spot here, okay? Because I know you're always up for the challenge. Let's see, Lucia, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so what does the man that she's communicating do with do? Um, I think he might be a farmer. He might just sort of work around in nature. Good, how do you know? Well, in, it begins with him planting potatoes as he sees the first lapwings return and sort of just the emphasis on his outsideness. Very good. So he's out in the nature, he's working with nature. It's not very clear if he's actually a farmer, but we know he's out there digging in the garden, doing something with gardening. Um, and Lucia, what does she do? Or what does our narrator do? It seems at some point that she's a, either a writer or that she sort of has not a corporate job, but she has a sort of very opposite job that he does, whereas he's outside and she's inside. Good, so she's locked up inside writing. It seems she's a writer and he's outside in nature working hard. Thank you very much, Lucia. All right, so if we understand that, we see the complete contrast in their living situations, right? He's outside, she's inside. But then she asks herself, your, is your life more real because you dig and sow? Does anyone want to try to interpret or kind of translate that line? What does it mean? Okay, let me find Amber. Go for it, Amber. Hello again. <laughs> um, so where it's like dig and sow, it's talking a lot about with the blank screen. That could show, because we can kind of infer that she's like a writer, but the headlines could mean she's a reporter. And if you know, reporters sometimes exaggerate or just completely BS a story. Um, so in a way it's like, dig and sow, she's comparing it to the spiritual aspects of like growth, renewal, regeneration, and how much she wants that. And, um, but no matter, and she's questioning, is this what she wants or does she want to be in Yorkshire? Not even with the guy himself, just with the place, but um, yeah, uh, that's think, why it's a question. Good, brilliant. So it's about, it's it's not about questioning, oh, I'm gonna move. Um, it's not about questioning whether or not she wants to be with him, but it's questioning kind of her lifestyle. Very good. See ya. You are unmuted. Um, I have another interpretation to that. Oh. What, like what I saw it as was that um, like kind of like some, well, this is not necessarily a stereotype, but people that like live in places like Yorkshire and like countryside, they feel that they're somewhat better mm -hmm. to, than people that live in like cities. So like, I, I feel like it's kind of like, not like sarcastic, but um, slightly judgmental on both parts. Yeah. Good. Yeah, great. So, um, so Sia was talking about how it's almost like a judgmental comment. 
Um, but the nice thing is that at the very beginning of the next stanza, it's almost like that judgment is taken away because as you wouldn't say so, right? So she wonders whether people there in that life, out there with nature, would judge her maybe for the type of lifestyle she's chosen or whether her lifestyle has as much meaning as him. But he seems to think, no, our, our lives are equally uh, important and have as much weight as each other. Um, Sia, am I unmuting you again? I just unmuted you again. Okay. Am I unmuted? Sia's <laughs> unmuted, go. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say that it's also in right of the middle of the poem and at the end of the stanza, which could show that it's the main focus of her own identity and also the main sort of conflict in their entire sort of relationship. Good. Perfect. So it kind of breaks it in half. Right. Um, Sia, you're unmuted. I don't know if you want to be unmuted, but your hand is up on the thing. I don't know why I can't unmute you. Oh, sorry. I forgot to put my hand down from what I oh. said before. Okay, brilliant. Okay, and Amber says they might send letters because she wants to live in the countryside and the man might want to convince her to come and join him there. Or he also would like to live in the city not realizing how problematic it is. Good. So again, what Amber is mentioning is that there's more an emphasis on the place than the actual relationship. And that leads us into this general idea that the biggest problem in this relationship seems to be the distance, right? It doesn't seem to be a lot other that is um, kind of disruptive within their relationship. But just like other poems we've seen, it kind of starts off slightly more negative and feeds into the more positive imagery, which is what we will look at. But before we look at stanza by stanza, looking at the language, I want us to think about the structure very quickly because there is a clear structure um, and the structure actually makes it very nice to um, compare to one other poem specifically, if you can remember which one that is. Right, so this poem is written in tercets. I can see what you have written, Alicia, good. So it is definitely that there are, a lot, that the lines and the are uneven, but, there are tercets in every single stanza, meaning every single stanza has three lines, okay? But three also, not the blockage of distance between them, good. So the three, like another poem we just looked at, shows that there's some kind of imbalance within their relationship, right? Like there's something in between them and that might be the distance. As uh, Lucia says, it could denote the blockade of distance between them. Perfect. Which other poem have we seen that uses the tercets throughout to show the distance? Winter Swans. Brilliant. Well done. Okay. So we see that. However, in Winter Swans, there is one big difference, which is at the end, it transforms into a couplet. Good, May. In this case, we don't have a couplet. It stays as a tercet throughout, which shows us that the distance doesn't become less by the end. The distance remains, right? Okay, the rest of the structural features, we have a lot of enjambments. Um, anyone know why you might have all of those enjambments mixed in, mixed in with a few sasuras, but mainly so many enjambments? Any ideas? For example, if we look at Okay, I'm gonna go, Alicia, I'm gonna unmute you. I'm gonna allow you to talk. I'm gonna give the example of going from singing as they read in, in the warmth. So first stanza to second stanza, there's an enjambment. Second stanza to third stanza, seeing the seasons turning. Okay, go on, Alicia. All right, wait, does it work? Yeah. Okay, so, um, seeing the seasons, the um, in German just like imitates like the changing seasons because um, in that stanza as well, it's also talking about the warmth. And then at, um, in the first stanza um, in February, it's more, um, it's like more in the winter, so it's quite cold. So it just 
like changes the seasons throughout the stanzas. Brilliant. So it's almost like switch in the um, seasons. Gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mute you. Switch in the seasons and how the time is passing and rolling on and how there's changes. Brilliant. And I'm gonna link that into what May was saying because it is almost like it is a very fluid relationship which is um, what you said with the letters kind of bridging the gap between them. Even though there's a physical distance, it seems that their relationship is quite strong because of their communication, their ability to continue their communication, and that's holding them together. We do see a, quite a few sasaurus here and there, um, which kind of breaks that up, which shows that although it is a fluid relationship, I do have moments of difficulty and it is slightly fractured, right? Um, in order to show the, the difficulty that the distance does bring. Even though if it's not letting them break their relation, it's not leading them to break that relationship, it is quite difficult as we see here. All right. Um, we're going to go through the first stanza and um, kind of look at some of the images there. When we get to the end, we'll look at the rhyme. So if you have anything to say about the rhyme scheme, wait till the end because we'll look at the internal rhyme and the free verse and all of that. Okay. Um, in February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwing return and came indoors to write to me. Remessa, he says, sets the opening scene and starts off in third person. Yeah, so here it's very interesting because as Remessa points out, the first stanza discusses the other person in this relationship as he, right? By the time we get to the second stanza, it already says you. So it becomes a lot more kind of personal. Amber, we'll get to the rhyme at the very end, okay? So we go from he to you. But in the first, it is kind of distant, right? With that third person use of he. Good. Uh, what else is in that first stanza? Any idea what else is in that first stanza? Personification, very good. So we see the knuckles singing, right? The personification, good. Sia says the plosives, the planting potatoes, brilliant. So it's almost as if the, these things are part of the stress that is being caused, although she seems to idolize and kind of enjoy the natural world that he's in, that distance, him being there and doing that seems to be explosive part of their relationship. May, she romanticizes the painful hard work with singing, also shows seasonal change and how they both experience the season differently. Very good. So that seasonal change is different for both of them. Um, and she romanticizes the painful hard work with singing. Yeah, great. So it's almost that juxtaposition between the planting and the digging and then the beautiful singing when he is going to go right to her. And that is really important, what we're going to look at there, which is the sesora between me and his. In the last line of the first um, stanza, right? We see that comma there, which is a sesoral pause, as May pointed out. I'll copy paste that into it. The chat again for those of you who didn't see it. Right? Okay, so the Sesora pause um, is interestingly placed between the me and the his, which might again show that there is something between the two people in this story, right? Something that is keeping them separate. Okay, so that image of his knuckles singing. Um, as they reddened with the warmth, it's almost when you come out of freezing cold and you go inside somewhere warm and it's and your hands kind of feel like they're burning, um, even though they're just frozen. And that kind of links into the fact that when he is speaking to her, even if it is through letters, that is when the warmth comes out. And May says it juxtaposes fluidity of the enjambment. Um, keep going, keep explaining what you mean, May. Let's see. Oh, I see what she means. Okay, so that Sasura, that pause there, juxtaposes the fluidity of the enjambment. Yeah, brilliant. So it shows how the relationship keeps going. Um, 
However, there are those segmented moments, those fractured moments with the cesura. Okay, good. All right, we also have the word right to me. Now I want you to underline or highlight or whatever the word right because we are going to be co collecting a lexical field of communication. All right, and the first one is right. Um, we do have singing, but I'm not going to make you um, underline that one. If you want to, you can add that in. So we are looking throughout the poem for a lexical field of communication, which you will see. All right, moving on to the second stanza. As they ran in, in the warmth, it's not romance, simply how things are. You are out there in the cold, season, seeing the seasons turning. So we have a declarative statement in the middle of that um, stanza that it's not romance, simply how things are. She's making a declaration of how their, how their relationship is. Maybe she's saying that it's not romance because they're not together. Um, Amber says the other interpretation, which is she fully states that she doesn't like him romantically. That could be, it could be more familial. However, it could also be that it's not as romantic because they're far apart um, or that he's sat in the cold by himself. That's not a romantic moment. Lucia says, could the lapwings also demonstrate the unusual freedom in the relationship given how casual yet melodic it seems? Good, I'm going to get to that in one second. The short sentence is very emphatic and shows that the situation is definitely not romantic. Good. Um, it wouldn't be considered or suggested. Good, so then we do have that confusion there. So I want everyone to kind of read through what people are saying there. And it is about how ambiguous the relationship is there. If it were not supposed to be a romantic relationship, then she wouldn't mention that it's not romance, right? That wouldn't be a thought in her mind. However, she does say that. So we do think that maybe at one point it was romantic or there's a hope that it does become romantic. Or, as some of you were saying, maybe it is just a declarative statement of her saying that's not the kind of relationship that we do have. Now, if we look back at what Lucia was talking about, if you see that image of the lapwings, um, these are birds, by the way, for those of you who don't know, they're birds who migrate back and forth um, between Africa, or they are uh, during um, the winter here in England, right? So, it could maybe link to the fact that uh, of what Lucia was saying, which is, let me go back up. Um, let me find Lucia. Okay, Lucia says that there's some kind of unusual freedom, right? That they're not stuck with each other at all times, um, but that, there we go. Um, but that um, they can go out into the world and do their own thing and continue their relationship through the letters. However, it could also be that she's hoping that he will return eventually, which is how the birds are, right? They eventually come back. Even though they go during one season, they come back in the next season, right? Um, so I want you to think about whether that kind of defines the relationship. Is, he, is she longing for him to return? Or is she happy with the distance? Okay, I'm gonna go up and read what Lucia just added. Could it also be his opinion that nature is not to be romanticized, but it is his work? They have two contrasting opinions on nature. Good, so it could be, and especially given the fact that she does often romanticize nature, okay? So it, it has a lot to do with some sort of longing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a longing to be with him. It could be a longing to be back in Yorkshire, a longing to be connected with nature again. But in his work, in his life, it doesn't seem like he's romanticizing nature, rather that he's using it for its purposes of food or maybe even a job, right? May says it isn't structured like a letter seems. Okay, very good. I'll get to that. But yes, it is more so not structured as a letter, but has some letter qualities. Okay, so I want you to also, in another color, or maybe you're gonna circle it, whatever you want to do, but there's another lexical field here, here if you see it, which is the lexical field of temperature, or words that link to temperature, right? The first one up there is warmth, 
at the beginning of stanza two and at the end of stanza two where it says cold. So we'll see that there's lots of temperatures going on, but that is a clear juxtaposition there in the cold and in the warm. It's almost like their relationship has a lot of back and forth and has a lot of kind of separation of ideas or ideals or lifestyles. Um, so we'll see that in the different temperatures that keep showing up. It could also be about how they see their relationship. Is it cold because they're distant? Or is it even warmer and more kind of passionate because it is distant, right? And they're able to communicate their feelings through the letter. Uh, there's an alternating structure, shows the juxtaposition, yeah, very good. Okay, we'll get a little bit more to structure at the very end. Um, she's uh, made very good, you're ahead of me in your mind thought, so in your mind process. So we'll get back to that at the very end. We'll look at the kind of more structural ideas and the rhyme schemes. Um, but we have those uh, words there that link to temperature. And then we literally see seeing the seasons turning, right? So we have that enjambment where the seasons turn. So the structure again here mirrors what is happening in their relationship, in their lives, where things are turning from one to the next. It's not like from one day to the next you can realize the change in season. It happens slowly, progressively, and this is something that the enjambment allows the poem to do, a change in the relationship that might not have happened so quickly, or they might not have noticed so quickly, but over time there was some kind of season changing, maybe. Okay, so um, as we said before we move on to stanza three, you can see that you there, which is what Remessa was talking about. Here we have direct address, so you out there, um, and that could show that they're growing in closeness, not physical closeness, but almost emotional, mental closeness as she stops addressing him as he and moves on to you. And this is, I think, linking to what Amber was saying that it almost feels like a letter or maybe a dedicated poem to someone because it becomes very personal about the you and the me, right? Uh, so seeing the seasons turning me with my heart full of headlines, feeding words onto a blank screen. Her work revolves around words and this contrast with his work, which is physical, very good. So we see here the head, heart full of headlines. And it's not her head full of headlines, it's her heart full of headlines. So her work does have a big part of her heart and it is important to her. She doesn't think it's nonsense. She does see the beauty in it. It's just very extremely opposite to what he does for a living, maybe with his more manual labor outside in the nature, um, where you can physically see the product of your creation, whereas in writing, it's a lot more difficult to do so. Heart full of headlines, what technique do we have there? Anyone, any ideas what technique we have there? Heart full of headlines. Alliteration, thank you very much, Sierra. Okay, so we have heart full of headlines. Um, it creates that kind of um, melody that we'll see um, again when we look at the free verse and the rhythm, the internal rhyme. She continuously makes it almost melodic with these alliterations and these half rhymes. Uh, she feeds people words, he feeds people potatoes. Uh, yeah, good. So it's almost like they do have similar purposes in the fact that they are providing something, um, hopefully, um, providing something given that her work will be published and that it will be helpful, whether it's sharing news or what it might be. But it is also the fact that they are so opposite, like hot and cold, like the temperatures we see throughout that it distances the relationship yet even more. Even though they do seem to understand each other and the importance of each other's work, they still seem very distant in that case, okay? Feeding words onto a blank screen. Now blank in this case is seen almost as a negative adjective, right? Because there's nothing there. And I want to go back to something May just said, which is, the letters mean a lot because they're the perfect combination of writing, but between the two worlds, right? So yet her job 
she's struggling at filling the pages there, right? Because it's blank. So she has to fill these blank pages on a blank screen. But it almost seems like their communication is very easy, right? It's this back and forth and it keeps their relationship alive. So that communication is much more important than whatever work it is that they're doing. The CSS could also be interpreted as endless possibilities for the two. Yes. So you could see the blank as almost a positive and see it as kind of a hopeful image for the future that they are going to fill this page together. Um, Ella says, feeding is more like his job. So maybe she's trying to mirror his work in her life. Yeah. And she doesn't just want to mirror the mannerisms, uh, which we would see in the verbs, but she also wants to continue to kind of bring the natural elements into her life which we can see through the imagery she chooses. Good. And this is where Lucia added in what, to what Ella was saying, that it's daunting for the two. These ideas are daunting, which leads them to have that constant back and forth. But that constant back and forth is also what keeps that relationship alive, right? That constant communication keeps it alive. Okay, so moving on to... Um, feeding words onto a blank screen is your life more real because you dig and so hopefully you have now underlined the words words and headlines because they link in with that lexical field of communication that you want to keep going okay then we have that question but the question is quickly answered almost with his opinion which makes it almost a hyperphora good man so that hyperphora does highlight that distance because she has to answer the question for him in a way because they cannot have that um, quick and constant communication. Great. So then you wouldn't say so. Breaking ice on a water butt, clearing a path through snow. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope. So where in this stanza, in the fourth stanza, where do we see the words that are linked with temperature? Ice, good, one more. Snow, perfect, Gabriela. Okay, what about words that link to communication? Good, the breaking ice was that. Yeah, headlines, good, link to it. But what about that four stanza, May? Words, brilliant. So we have words um, for communication. Make sure you're underlining, say so, good. So talking, make sure you have your lexical field of temperature and your lexical field of communication that you pull up throughout the whole poem so that when you, can, uh, when you want to discuss it and compare it to other poems, that's what you can draw in on. Right, so we have the ice and the snow. How how come there's such cold temperature towards the end of this poem? I mean, it's the second to last stanza. So how come we haven't moved into a warmer temperature to describe the relationship? Good, May says it's unresolved, right? It's almost like we've highlighted the issue in their relationship, which is distance, but the distance is not going to be bridged, okay, for any time soon. There is a slight hope in the end there when we see the light and night, but there's no clear resolution. And therefore we can't break that image of ice or snow. And it is the season that he is in. So maybe even though she's feeling closer to him in this case, when she's writing this poem, Maybe it's then him who is feeling more disconnected and that lack of um, communication from person to person is highlighted through their distance. May says the physical distance isn't closed. This makes it realistic. Good. And we've seen that quite often in a lot of the other poems where distance is making the relationship seem a lot more realistic. We can think of another poem where that is done. Any other? Good. Lucia says winter swans and mother any distance. 
Brilliant. So that distance is enclosed. Mother and a distance is a really interesting example because they, they seem to have quite a similar relationship in the fact that the distance isn't necessarily seen as something that will break their relationship. It's just part of the relationship. Right, so the child is getting further and further away from the mother, increasing and increasing the distance, yet the mother's bond to the child does not break. Winter swans, the same. Good. All right, so clearing a path through the snow. What has anything to do with this uh, clearing? Amber said it begins and ends in a way cold, showing another year has passed and nothing has changed but the distance isn't threatening to break them apart more than they already are good. And that is why Amber said previously that it's almost like a cyclical structure beginning and ending with this cold imagery, right? And that's important because we see, although their communication seems to show closeness in their emotional relationship, the physical distance hasn't yet changed. So why is he clearing a path through the snow? How could this be metaphorical for part of their relationship? What's being cleared? Maybe through the letters, maybe through this poem, what is being cleared? The letters bridge the distance. Yeah, very good. So maybe the, the clearing of the path, the clearing of the confusion is done through these letters where they're able to express and understand each other's part in this relationship. All right, let's look at the last stanza. Who sends me word of that other world pouring air and light into an envelope so that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. Okay, I'm gonna go slowly up. Um, Amber says, air and light juxtapose, juxtaposes an envelope. Yeah, air and light is kind of free. An envelope is trapping of whatever is going in. However, there is another interpretation there. Let's see, uh, Lucia says, it has also changed to technology towards the end, which could show the romance is slowly faltering. Instead, they have come to terms with the distance. Good. So they have understood the distance between them, but they've almost come to understand how to, to manage this distance, right? Tapping, good. So it's almost like they now have that technology to communicate. Remessa says they have a long distance relationship in different locations. They live apart, but remain connected. Very good. We see especially in that selection of the word souls, which is, um, Part of the religious imagery that she uses throughout which shows the spiritual connection that they have even though there is physical distance between them they still have that close spiritual connection yeah? um, what words in that last stanza link to communication there's three key ones there messages good News, very good. One more. Envelope, perfect. Okay, so the news is an interesting link to communication because in this case, it's the news, the global news versus their personal news, which they get to share with each other in the um, letters, right? Now they're staying connected by watching the same news at the same, well, the same news in their separate houses which almost links them as if they're watching these global spectacles together, even though they're not, right? And then the last image of temperature is the word icy. Good. So when we see our souls tap out messages across the icy miles, what does that show us? Why are they icy miles? Anyone want to talk, be brave enough to talk? Or else I'm going to unmute someone who's unwilling. Good. Sia, you're unmuted. Oh, um. I see miles. Why is it I see and not just miles? Um, like, she kind of, like, I see kind of links to hatred. Good. And she hates the fact that it's, 
that is miles. Good. So she dislikes the distance. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, let's see here. The ice creates distance between them. Good. Yeah, definitely. Hence him breaking that ice. Very good. So the ice is this metaphor for the actual distance. The hated distance between them, she seems to very much dislike it and link it with negative images and cold imagery. And that is why in stanza four, we do have that image of the breaking the ice. So it's almost like he's maybe willing to break the distance or she's willing or they're both willing. She misses him, Jasmine says, and would feel bad about it. Good. So she would feel bad about the distance of the relationship. We do have hope that their relationship might come closer with this idea of the light and the night, right? But it isn't, again, like the rest of the poem, it is very ambiguous. We don't know if that ending shows us that there will be a change in the relationship or if this is just a kind of conversation about their relationship. Lucia says the focus of it at the end can portray the pain of the separation. Yeah, there's that clear pain in the separation, but also the beauty of their distance is that although they are separated, their souls tap out messages together at the same time to each other, right? So their souls are forever intertwined. Seattle says, could it be that they both accept the cold, yet this distance between them? Yeah, yet thin distance between them. Good, so they have that distance between them. They both accept it. They don't both dislike it, but it's become part of their relationship. Lucia says, ice can also show frozen in time, which actually could enjoy, oh yeah, enjoy the romance. And it's just them in their own little world, the world of words, beautiful. And the world of words is shown not just through the letters that they're sending back and forth, but this poem, right? And if you go back to what we said about um, Dooley at the very beginning is that the critics said she's able to find images for complex feelings. And what you think about is that is the attempt of every poet out there, which is to try to paint a picture of an emotion that you don't know how to express, right? So if the poet doesn't invoke any emotions in you, then they haven't done their work, their work properly. And even better, a great poet is able to create a poem where you, your emotional reaction might be different to the person sitting next to you because you have a different, different life story to add into your interpretation of the poem, right? And what she is so good at is that she is able to take this poem, make it so ambiguous that each of us is able to decipher whether or not we see this relationship as romantic, as working, as failing, as distant, as close. It depends on what you are looking for in that poem. But as Sia does mention, it ends up with that icy image, yet, and I want to read out what she said one more time, ice can show that they are frozen in a moment. Even though the time keeps passing, their relationship and their connection is frozen in that moment because it is stronger than the distance, right? And Lucius added that they are frozen in a world of words. Right? Their relationship will forever be alive in those letters. Right? And also in this poem. So that is part of the whole theme is that the words are so important. Every single word, every natural image in this poem holds a much deeper emotional meaning. Um, and we know that. I know... Um, if some of my students from my classes are on here, they say, but Miss, how do you know that the poet wanted that? Well, in this case, we know because she literally said it. She literally said in an interview, I want people to be able to interpret it the way that they think best fits their emotional experiences in life. Sarah says, 
I think that the ice shows that their relationship is not as stable as she tries to make it because ice melts. Good. So we, again, it all depends on the emotion that you feel these two characters have through the images she uses to um, kind of explore. Mm -hmm. Ice does melt, and you are right in the sense that it could show instability, but could you also argue that it shows stability because ice melts, so the distance will melt away? It won't be something that separates them forever. It's just a momentary frozen um, kind of obstacle that they will eventually let melt away. And Sarah says, and she doesn't want to accept the fact that they will eventually lose touch. It is possible because we don't see a very positive ending um, come up. But at the same time, as the seasons are changing, they haven't lost touch, right? They've only deepened their connection based on the media available to them. Or you can interpret it as Sarah says and say, actually, well, maybe they are losing touch and the relationship is becoming closer. Good, so progression. And actually, degression. You can look at it as a positive move or a negative move. Right, guys, I can acknowledge that we only have five minutes left, so I just want to think about the rhyme scheme very quickly. Um, those of you who have done research, I'm sure you've already noticed this, but there's a lot of internal um, rhymes, and most of the internal rhymes are internal half rhymes. Okay, so we have, for example, digging, planting, and singing in the first stanza. So digging, planting, singing. Those are all half rhymes because they have that, um, good, I'm gonna get to that in one second, May. Um, because they have that ing at the end, they do slightly rhyme. If you remember in my classroom, you'll know the sound that I do when we talk about half rhymes is eh, meaning it's, almost there if you feel like it could rhyme but it's not quite there so we have that we have that throughout again with the seeing and seasons in the second one although that might not look like a rhyme it is a half run because of the c and the c right that's happening there um we have again the words like word and world half rhyme and then as may points out at the end in the last stanza we actually have night and light, which are much fuller rhymes than any of the half rhymes we've had before, which is interesting because a lot of you out there were just arguing that their relationship doesn't strengthen at the end, but the rhyme scheme seems to strengthen at the end. So it might be not necessarily that their relationship strengthens, but maybe the communication about their relationship strengthens, right? Because the rhyme has strengthened, so their communication is improving. Or for those of you who said there is hope for the relationship in the future, you could see that it's becoming fuller, becoming more positive, um, and that would be it becoming much more like a whole rhyme. Um, we also have the whole poem being a free verse, right? That means that the end words of each line don't rhyme like what we're used to, it's just internal rhymes, um, which could show a lack of cohesion or a lack of unity throughout. It's almost like um, the fluidity is more important than the lyrical sound of the end words, right? So maybe a lack of cohesion or different interpretation. Maybe that's just more natural. The rhymes are given, half rhymes are given throughout instead of forced to be at the end of a line, which could show, like their relationship, things happen naturally, they don't happen perfectly, right? Okay, so guys, I'm going, I've recorded this, which means that you can, again, watch it on YouTube if you felt any part was very difficult. Um, yeah, I can see you're pointing out the stanzas and tercets, good. So if you want to rewatch, we did talk about the tercets at the beginning of this session, so you can look back on that. Make sure if you want to see what anybody has said, you quickly look through that now. Um, but I read a lot of them out during the video, so you can look back at that as well. Our next se session is on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. 
So please make sure you are there and have everything ready for that. Your teachers will alert you about um, what to do beforehand. Smiley faces as always, let's see. Good, Amber, thanks May, you're very welcome. All right guys, see lots of smiley faces, have a lovely day, it is still- Hey, smileys. <laughs> Amber, you scared me. Um, oh. Wait, can you hear me? Now I can, yeah. Oh. I've muted you, but it's very sunny outside, so people, if you're allowed to go on your one walk, go for it. Two walks, I think we're allowed infinite walks. Maybe we shouldn't record this part of the conversation. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, Jasmine. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Email me if you have any questions, guys. Bye.